He has been down every road, every street, and every city and town that you live on, and he's been doing a lot of that in the last year. And why? Because he wants to speak to you. He wants to engage in a dialogue. He wants to know the challenges you face, and he wants to be a partner with you in resolving those challenges. He wants to make sure that every citizen in this Commonwealth enjoys the same opportunities for success and blessings that he and our family have. And he wants especially to make sure that you know that we see our stake in your future. And we hope that you see your stake in our future. Deval, Deval, to me, and I think to so many of you here, epitomizes the hope and the hard work and the commitment and the promise and the high ambitions for this state. And I promise you he will bring all of that to this state when he's elected with your help to be the next governor of Massachusetts. Deval, where are you? Thank you so much. Thank you. My goodness, <laughs> Diane is an extraordinary person. Um, those of you who know Diane will know that she, in fact, is the talent in our family. <laughs> the more that I'm out there on the campaign trail with her, people tend to look at her and look at me and say, well, why that guy? Why not? Uh, <laughs> In, uh, in 22 years of marriage, Diane has been an extraordinary partner, an extraordinary mother to those fantastic young women up there. And she's been an extraordinary friend, too. And she will be an extraordinary First Lady of Massachusetts. <laughs> Congressman McGovern, I want to thank you as well. You, uh, your leadership in Congress, your leadership and your commitment to Massachusetts, your early support uh, and friendship to this campaign and to me has just meant all the world and I'm grateful to you for it. We need to face the plain fact that at this moment in time, the same old thing from the same old insiders is not enough to move us forward. So let's be candid, but let's not be afraid, because it's important to realize that this is not the first time that we as a commonwealth have been at a crossroads. For three centuries, great movements for change have been launched and nurtured from Massachusetts. Samuel Adams, Frederick Douglass, Lucy Stone, to name just a few, gathered their fellow citizens in their time in this very hall to call the moral question of their day, to rededicate themselves to the long human struggle for freedom and justice and progress. In each case, this is where the people of Massachusetts came in search of a reason to hope. And in every case, the people left this building to build a better future. Now, So this is not the first time that Massachusetts has been at a crossroads. And it's not the first time that I have been at a crossroads. I was 14 years old when I came to Massachusetts in 1970. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a two-bedroom tenement with my mother and my sister and my grandparents. I went to overcrowded and sometimes violent public schools and my family spent some time on public assistance when that's what we needed to get over. In the fall of 1970, I got my break. A program called A Better Chance gave me a scholarship to Milton Academy. It might as well have been a, the other side of the moon, to tell you the truth. I remember the first time I saw the campus thinking I had never seen so much privately owned lawn in one place. <laughs> At home uh, in Chicago, I shared a set of bunk beds with my mother and my sister, rotating as we did 
from the top to the bottom to the floor, every third night on the floor. At Milton, every boy got his own bed and his own desk. I thought I'd hit the jackpot. <laughs> I did well at Milton. I earned a chance to go to college. And I remember when the letter came saying I was admitted to the one I wanted to go to, I called home and I got my grandmother on the phone. I said, Graham, I'm going to college next year. I'm going to Harvard. And she carried on and was all excited. I mean, just made all kinds of noise. And then she paused and she said, now, where is that anyway? <laughs> it turns out, I think, that she understood that milestone better than I did. Because what she was excited about was not the prestige, it was the chance. It was the opportunity. That's what lasts. And I have had... And I have had some extraordinary chances to go to Harvard College and law school, to live and work in the Darfur region of the Sudan, to practice law for poor families and housing court and big companies and courts of appeal and everything and everyone in between, to serve my country as head of the Civil Rights Division in the Clinton administration. And I want to tell you that for a kid from the south side of Chicago to sit in the Oval Office and have the President of the United States turn to you and ask, what do you think we should do is a heady thing. <laughs> I've had the chance to serve the employees and the shareholders and the management and the customers of two great companies, Texaco and the Coca-Cola Company. But I can still remember when I first got to Milton. I wasn't a lawyer then. I wasn't a business leader or a senior government official then. I wasn't a father or a husband. Goodness knows I wasn't a candidate for governor. <laughs> I was a 14-year-old boy staring at a chance different from anything my own family and friends could even imagine. And I was scared. But my grandmother had a saying that fortified me then. She used to say, hope for the best and work for it. Hope for the best and work for it. And that's what I did. I hoped for the best. I learned how not to accept what's right in front of me, what someone else said my limits were. I learned how to imagine a better life and a better way, and I worked for it. I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I learned to listen to common sense and wisdom from whatever still small voice it came, to be true to my core values, and to ignore those who called me naive or told me to accept something less. Standing on the brink of an uncertain future, with all the challenges we face today, all I know how to do is to hope for the best and work for it. And that... <laughs> and that, fundamentally, is what I'm asking you to do now, here, right here in Massachusetts. I want you to see what I see about what's possible in Massachusetts and to work for that. I see a concentration of brain power and venture capital in Massachusetts. I see the same imagination, wit, and creativity of the people who inspired and prepared me, channeled to build a stronger biotech industry, or frankly, anything else we set our minds to. I see us building world leadership in renewable and alternative energy and conservation technology and products and services so that the whole world becomes our customer. Our biggest challenge is to resist our own cynicism. My late uncle Sonny was a sometime resident of that little tenement I described earlier in Chicago. And he struggled through most of his life with an addiction to heroin. He used to shoot up in the living room when he thought no one was looking. I know now 
that he was looking for a way to soothe his pain, a way not to face his own personal demons and challenges, a way out. Well, cynicism is an opiate, too. It's a drug, and it's everywhere. It helps us brace ourselves against the pain of disappointment to endure the letdown we've come to expect. Some of our political leaders and some of the media, frankly, are dealers, peddling cynicism by tearing down anything positive and hopeful. And And let's also be clear, cynicism is addictive. It becomes our drug of choice. It leads us to expect less and demand less of our leaders and of ourselves. It restricts our capacity to care about the problems we've created for ourselves and to imagine a better way. Cynicism, more than anything, is what holds us back. My friends, it is time to put our cynicism down. Put it down. I am not asking anybody, I am not asking anybody to take a chance on me. I'm asking you to take a chance on your own aspirations. Take a chance on hope. I will make mistakes and missteps, both as a candidate and as governor. I'm an unfinished man and I have my flaws just as the next. And as the campaign gains strength, you know how this works. I'm sure our competition and the media will make as much as they possibly can of my flaws. <laughs> but don't give up on me, because I will never give up on you.